Hello, and welcome to the channel. When the lifeless body of Nicole van den Herk was found on the 22nd of November 1995, Dutch investigators would spend the next 16 years trying to find her killer. But on the 8th of March 2011, a significant breakthrough would come in the form of a Facebook confession from none other than Nicole's own stepbrother, Andy van den Herk. In today's video, we'll be looking at this story in more detail, as well as looking at why Andy publicly admitted to an earth-shattering crime. But before we get into today's case, if you're interested in true crime, please give this video a like and if you're new here, subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so you never miss an upload. Thank you, and let's begin. Our story begins in Erkelands, Germany, on the 4th of July 1980. Nicole was born to single mother Angelica Techtmeyer. In terms of her biological father, not much is known about him. Some reported that Nicole's father was a married neighbour of Angelica, while others claimed she was the daughter of a German entrepreneur, and it wasn't until a blood test was carried out that he would be identified. Although the father's name to my knowledge was never disclosed to the public, and he didn't appear to play an active role in her life. Regardless, what is known is that shortly after Nicole's birth, her mother began a relationship with a Dutch singer named Ad van den Herk, who would go on to raise Nicole as his own. Soon after their relationship began, Angelica would move to the Netherlands with Ad, taking Nicole with her, and the couple would eventually marry, with Nicole adopting Ad van den Herk's surname. Sadly, Ad's marriage to Angelica would be a short-lived one, and by 1989, the pair divorced. A custody battle would take place, which resulted in Ad winning full custody of his stepdaughter. Ad van den Herk would go on to marry a woman named Jolanda, who herself had children from a previous relationship, and for a while, everything seemed normal. That was until April 1995, when Nicole would discover the heartbreaking news that her biological mother, Angelica, who by now was back living in Germany, had ended her own life. While it seems as though Nicole's relationship with her mother at the time was strained, the news would have undoubtedly had an adverse effect on her. Thankfully, Nicole, who was now living in Eindhoven, had her family for support, including Ad's mother, whom Nicole spent much time with while Ad was away working. Six months later, the 6th of October 1995, Nicole van den Herk was now working at a bakery at her local shopping centre. On this day, she left her grandmother's home in the early hours by bike to make the journey to work. However, she wouldn't arrive. After Nicole failed to show up to work, she was reported missing to police and a search was immediately underway to track her down. That same day, at approximately 6pm, police would find Nicole's bike in the River Dommel, However, there was no trace of Nicole. Over the next couple of weeks, police would interview friends and family, as well as members of the public, but nothing of note would be found until the 19th of October, when Nicole's backpack was found near the Eindhoven Canal. Over the next two days, police would focus their search on the canal and its south bank, but no other trace of Nicole was found. On the 24th of October, an anonymous call was made to police from a man claiming that Nicole had been killed and that he could identify the killer. But before any further information could be obtained, the caller hung up abruptly. Attempts to trace the call were unsuccessful and another potential lead went cold. Police refocused their search on the Eindhoven Canal on the 28th and 29th of October. By this time, police were working multiple theories including one which they believed that Nicole may have run away to go back to Germany to be with her family there. Ad, however, firmly shot this theory down, stating that Nicole simply couldn't have run away from her family in the Netherlands. By the 20th of November 1995, investigators were still no closer to finding Nicole. No further clues had been found, and while appeals to the public garnered around 300 leads, these all led to dead ends but just two days later, the investigation would take a dramatic and tragic turn. 
On the 22nd of November 1995, a man was hiking through the woods between Mielo and Lirop when he would stumble upon the body of a young woman. After contacting the authorities, police swooped down onto the scene and quickly learned that the body was that of Nicole Vandenhoek. Tragically, the location where she was found was just minutes from her grandmother's home. A post-mortem examination was carried out and revealed that Nicole had suffered a brutal end. She had sustained two fractures to her jaw, multiple injuries to her hands and fingers. There were signs that she had been sexually abused and finally, a stab wound was found which fractured her rib. It was this that experts believed was the killing blow. Despite this, there was evidence to suggest that Nicole had put up a fight throughout her ordeal. DNA samples were collected, but given that DNA analysis was still in its early days, little of note was gathered at the time. The news of Nicole's killing sent shockwaves through the Netherlands. This was evident when Nicole was laid to rest on the 28th of November, with over 1,000 people attending to pay their respects. Police knew that they needed a quick result, but sadly there was little to go on. In January 1996, police would release the anonymous telephone call to the public, in the hopes someone may recognise the voice on the line. But again, nothing came of it. The following month, a young woman named Celine Hartox, who was known to the Vanden Herks, came forward to say that she knew the men responsible for killing Nicole. At the time of her statement, Celine was in police custody after being released for trafficking heroin. She said that the men had forced her to smuggle the drugs, and it was these same men who had taken Nicole's life. While Ad van den Herk was reported as saying he believed the young girl's claims, police were of a different opinion. They stated that her testimony was flawed and as such, unreliable. Investigators would ultimately decide against pursuing her claims further. Over the next several months, detectives would begin to focus their investigation inward, focusing on both Ad van den Herk and Nicole's stepbrother Andy van den Herk. It's not known why this was, but both Ad and Andy were arrested in connection with Nicole's death between May and June 1996, but both were quickly released and eventually cleared. In a desperate attempt, a reward was offered for information which would lead to an arrest, but just like before, nothing of significance would come from it. Eventually, the case would grow cold and over time, fewer detectives were assigned to work on Nicole's case. A cold case team would reopen Nicole's case in 2004, but no further progress would be made. As the years wore on, it seemed as though that Nicole's murder would end up being one which was destined to remain unsolved. That was until 2011, 16 years since Nicole was killed, that a Facebook post would blow the case wide open. On the 8th of March 2011, Andy van den Herk would log into Facebook and post the following message. I will be arrested today at the murder of my sister. I confessed. We'll get in contact soon. At the time of making the post, Andy had moved to the United Kingdom and as you can imagine, the post shocked many of Andy's friends and family. He would be arrested that same day and on the 18th of March 2011, he appeared at Westminster Magistrates Court on extradition proceedings which were brought by Dutch authorities. On the 30th of March, he was extradited to the Netherlands. But just five days following his extradition, Andy van den Herk was again released from custody. Other than his Facebook confession, which he'd since retracted, no other evidence connecting Andy to the murder could be established. Now you might be asking yourself why Andy would confess to killing his sister on Facebook of all places, and upon hearing about this story for the first time, I wondered this too. But the reason, at least in Andy's mind, made sense. As the years passed with no sign of Nicole's killer being caught, as well as the dwindling attention in the case itself, Andy made the bold choice to incriminate himself in the hope that it would bring back attention to Nicole's case. Andy was also aware that DNA testing had advanced leaps and bounds in the years following Nicole's death, and he believed that by confessing to the crime, he would be able to get her body exhumed for further testing, which would reveal the real killer. Andy would later say in an interview, quote, 
I wanted to get her exhumed and get DNA off her. I kind of set myself up, and it could have gone horribly wrong. To get her exhumed, I had to put steps in place to get her exhumed. I went to the police and said I did it. She is my sister. Absolutely. I miss her every day. Andy believed, however, that Nicole's killer was none other than her stepfather, Ad Vandenhoek. The risk Andy placed on his own freedom and reputation had amazingly pulled off. Shortly after he was released from custody, a new cold case team was assigned to Nicole Vandenhoek's case, and in September 2011, her body was exhumed for further testing. When Nicole's remains were forensically examined, they revealed that foreign DNA had been found. Upon the announcement of this news, police would receive around 20 new leads, breathing life into the investigation once more. The DNA test results revealed two distinct profiles, as well as other peaks which were detected that some concluded may have belonged to a third individual. One of the distinct profiles was that of Nicole's boyfriend at the time. However, it doesn't appear as though he was ever considered a suspect during the investigation. The other distinct profile belonged to an unknown male. While police worked to identify the man, the media began to speculate as to whether the third peaks were actually a third DNA profile, with both Ad and Andy's names being mentioned as potential owners. Cold case investigators then searched for similar crimes which took place in the surrounding area, and found another case which occurred in September 2000, where a young woman was taken from her bicycle and was yeah. at Knife Point in Vulcan's Ward, about 22 minutes driving distance south from Eindhoven. Not only did the woman survive the attack, but an arrest was made which resulted in a successful conviction in 2001. Satisfied with the similarities of this case and Nicole's, they compared the DNA samples collected at the time of the crime and compared this to the DNA found on Nicole's remains, where they would find a match. On the 14th of January 2014, police arrested a then 46-year-old man known only to the public as Joss de G. Little is known about Joss due to the Netherlands' stance on revealing the full names of criminal suspects. That being said, what we do know about him isn't exactly something that would make a parent proud to call him their son. Joss de G had been convicted on three occasions on rear charges, and we know that he was sentenced to three years prison time and compulsory treatment in a psychiatric hospital for one of these convictions. Investigators learned that mere hours before Nicole's disappearance, Joss had got into a fight with an ex-girlfriend, leaving the home with the dispute unresolved. Joss de G would deny killing Nicole ensuring that the case would go to trial, which began in April 2014. His defence would immediately jump upon the DNA evidence, arguing that the presence of other DNA found on Nicole's body meant that it was possible someone other than their client was responsible for Nicole's death. They would further claim that Joss G had consensual sex with Nicole prior to her death. Joss G himself would initially say that he didn't know Nicole, only to backtrack on this statement saying that he may have had sex with Nicole, but that it was hard to recall due to his lifestyle at the time. In July 2014, the murder charge was dropped in favour of a manslaughter charge. The defence would even go as far to suggest that the DNA results may have revealed that Nicole had multiple sexual partners, and that she may have been pregnant at the time of her murder, alluding to the court that it was one of these other individuals who were responsible. Remember when I discussed the peaks in the DNA test results, which suggested a third DNA profile? Well, this proved to be a sticking point for the prosecution, who struggled to explain this away. Experts were brought in to give their opinions of the results, with one admitting that it was surprising that a complete DNA profile couldn't be sampled, but explained that this was likely because Nicole's body was already in an advanced state of decomposition at the time she was found. By November 2015, the trial was still ongoing, but was suspended for two weeks after two new witnesses came forward, claiming to have heard Josta G admitting to killing a teenage girl. In one of the accounts, the witness was staying at the same mental institution about 10 years prior. There, he told her that he strangled a girl after she mocked the size of his penis. According to this witness, Josta G was recounting this story in a boastful manner explaining that he was never caught for the crime. 
although he stopped short at naming the victim. The other witness was also present at the institution at the time and claimed to have overheard Joster G admitting to killing a girl, but he again failed to name the victim. The trial would rage on for well over two years, with the prosecution demanding on the 16th of October 2016 that Joster G serve 14 years for the rear and manslaughter charges. But on the 21st of November 2016, he was only found guilty on the rear charge and acquitted of the manslaughter charge due to the DNA test results failing to convince the court that a possible third suspect could have been responsible. Joster G was also determined to be legally insane at the time the crime took place, which the courts also took into consideration. He was sentenced to just five years prison time for his crime, after which he would be institutionalized for psychiatric treatment for an undetermined amount of time. Immediately after the sentencing, an appeal was successfully lodged by the prosecution and the appeal trial began on the 28th of August 2018. The prosecution was still seeking a 14 year prison term for Joster G and the DNA evidence was up for scrutiny yet again. This time, the court was convinced that the so-called third profile was more likely a result of contamination on or before the samples were collected, effectively ruling out another suspect. In fact, during the original trial, it was revealed by experts who analyzed the DNA that it was 2.28 million times more likely than not that Joster G was the owner of one of the two DNA profiles. On the 9th of October 2018, Joster G's manslaughter acquittal was overturned and his sentence was increased from 5 years to 12. The plan to institutionalize him after his sentence was served remained unchanged and in June 2020, the Dutch Supreme Court upheld this decision, sealing his fate. Joster G's actions that fateful morning on the 6th of October 1995 sent a devastating ripple effect through the Van den Herk family. Not only did they have to cope with the ordeal of losing Nicole, but Ad was accused by none other than Andy, his own son for the crime. Andy's decision to confess to a murder he didn't commit was mainly driven by his own suspicion that Ad had impregnated Nicole, and in a bid to hide this, he killed her. While the risk he took ultimately paid off, I can't imagine how either Ad or Andy must have felt once the truth came out, and it's not known how their relationship was after Joster G's conviction. Regardless, Andy was clearly troubled enough over the lack of progress with the investigation that he was prepared to drag his own name through the dirt to bring attention back to Nicole's story, and I have to say, you have to respect what he did. For me, Andy's actions were nothing short of heroic. Sadly, along with dealing with the loss of Nicole, Andy seemed to be struggling with his own demons. On the 27th of August 2021, Andy posted the following message to Facebook. I'm ready to say goodbye. The pills will do the rest. Tragically, it appears as though Andy followed through, as his Facebook account has since been changed to a remembrance page. Thank you for watching. If you found this story interesting, don't forget to give the video a like and if you're new here, subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell to stay informed whenever I upload a new video. If you want to support the channel in other ways, you could become a member by joining my Patreon or YouTube channel membership for exclusive content and early access audio to my true crime videos before they go public. Speaking of which, here's a shout out to those who are already supporting my work. Needlem Fur, The Alabastard, Mr. Gently Benevolent, Amanda, Krista, Shamu Smith, Angie Thompson, Holy Holy, Lord UK, Gaming Since the 90s, Marina Bolotta, CSD, and Airy Berry True Crime. Thank you for your continued support. Until next time, take care and goodbye for now.